Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining this morning's Beef Brunch Educational Series webinar. My name is Ashley Edwards, and I'll be hosting for you today. Our speaker is Dr. Gary Hay. Um, Dr. Hay is a professor and extension specialist um, specializing largely in genetics for beef cattle and dairy cattle. Today, he's going to be presenting selecting beef bulls for terminal crossbreeding programs. Just a few notes before we get started. Um, your microphones are going to be muted, and we ask that you keep them that way throughout the entire webinar. If you've joined us online or through the Teams app, um, you can enter questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. If you've called in, um, you can text your questions to me. My number is 512-818-5476. Again, if you've called in and you're listening, you can text questions to me throughout the webinar at 512-818-5476. Um, for time's sake, we are going to wait to answer questions until the end of the presentation. With that, Dr. Hay, thank you so much for joining us this morning, um, and you should be able to start whenever you're ready. Okay, Dr. Edwards, thank you. Uh, I appreciate y'all inviting me to do this and, and uh, looking forward to the program. <clears throat> As uh, Dr. Edwards said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about selecting beef bulls for terminal crossbreeding. Uh, <clears throat> that's a question I get quite a bit. It, it, uh, that people want to know what kind of bulls or what, what breeds to use. Uh, when they're going to just be producing terminal calves and so I'm going to go ahead and start the pro presentation and uh, we'll get in get right into it. As most of you know, <clears throat> I'm sure crossbreeding is a is a really common tool used in the beef industry. It's an excellent method for improving economic value in commercial beef cattle herds. Uh, and the reason it works so well, it takes advantage of two different genetic effects that are produced when you cross two or more breeds of cattle. The first set of gen, uh, effects are called additive genetic effects, and these are the genetic effects which have a direct impact on phenotypic performance for a specific trait, and I emphasize the word direct impact. These effects are caused or passed directly from one generation to the next by way of the individual genes. In other words, it's these individual genes that affect the individual animal's uh, phenotype. In other words, the genes an individual inherits from each of its parents affects his performance, and those genes are not only inherited from the parents, but they're also passed on to the offspring. Okay, when you're talking about bull selection in, in any program, whether it's terminal select, uh, crossbreeding, rotational, whatever, remember that half of the genes in your calves come from the bull. So selecting a bull with superior genes for specific traits is a very important factor in, in determining the performance of your calves. Keep in mind that even though one, a, a cow normally produces one calf a year, that bull you're producing or you're using uh, is probably leaving somewhere between 10 and 20, maybe 25 calves a year in your herd. <laughs> Selecting a bull with inferior genetics for specific traits is not going to produce high performing calves regardless of his breed. And some people kind of make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, I want to uh, I want to crossbreed. And so I'm going to go buy a bull of this specific breed and that's going to help. Uh, produce better calves. Well, if that's just a, just a bull and he's he doesn't have superior genetics for the traits that you're trying to improve then he's, he's really not going to uh, improve the performance in your calves very much. <clears throat> so when you're selecting bulls, even in a crossbreeding situation, I highly recommend that you always look at the EPDs on those bulls and compare and select your bulls based on these, those uh, EPD comparisons, even in a uh, crossbreeding program. And the reason is EPDs are the only really accurate method for determining which bulls are genetically superior for an individual trait. And you can see from this slide, I've given a brief description of what EPDs are. They're statistical calculations that take into account uh, performance data on the individual bulls, uh, their progeny and other types of relatives. And because of the fact that they use uh, a lot of different data from different relatives of the bull in the data set, they are generally much more accurate than selection using individual performance data. The other thing that makes them much more accurate, as I said, it, they take into account adjusted performance data. That data is adjusted for known environmental effects such as age, uh, season uh, in which the animals are raised, season of calving or season of birth, and some other things. So 
if you're going to select bulls, even in a crossbreeding situation, it's a good idea to compare those bulls using EPDs for the traits you're interested in. <clears throat> the second genetic effect that, that we take a, advantage of in crossbreeding is a gene interaction effect. These are genetic effects on phenotypic performance for individual traits that are caused by combinations of genes that the individual inherited from its parents. In other words, if, if it's a crossbred individual and he got half his parent, his genes from his, let's just say Angus sire and half from his Hereford dam, then the combination of those genes and how they interact will enhance the phenotypic performance for many traits in that offspring, in that F1 cross. And that effect is called heterosis or hybrid vigor. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of hybrid vigor. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies done, there's a lot of studies done on that uh, in the past and still some studies being done in the beef industry. And it's been found that for some of these traits, like particularly growth traits, uh, if you get the right combination of, uh, of genes, you can get up as much as a 28% uh, enhancement and phenotypic performance in those F1 crosses and those F2 crosses. <clears throat> All right, but you got to keep in mind that heterosis or hybrid vigor is a phenotypic effect that is caused by an underlying genetic interaction. The phenotypic effect itself is not passed to the crossbred calves, just the underlying gene combinations that cause the effect. So if you take these F1 calves or F2 calves that are very fast growing, you know, large, heavy muscle, fast growing, uh, and you breed them, that effect on their phenotypes is caused by an underlying gene combination that is not passed on to their offspring because they don't pass that combination. They pass one or more of the genes, but not both of them. So you got to keep in mind that just because they perform well doesn't mean necessarily mean their offspring are going to perform very well. <clears throat> okay, when we talk about crossbreeding, there are basically two primary forms of crossbreeding, two different types, and I'm sure most of you have heard of these. There's terminal crossbreeding and rotational crossbreeding. Terminal crossbreeding is generally referred to as a one generation cross where all the offspring, both males and females, are marketed for slaughter. In other words, these animals are not normally kept for breeding purposes. On the other hand, rotational crossbreeding is a multi-generational system where some of the offspring, especially the females, are kept for breeding and then they're allowed to produce female offspring. And then those F2 female offspring are then bred back and, and produce more breeding offspring. Rotational crossbreeding, I'm sure you can, you, you can see, uh, can also use more than two, two breeds to produce offspring across multiple generations. And that's basically the difference between those. So these are kind of arbitrary terms that we use in genetics. Uh, I'm going to talk about one case where something that you would think was a rotational crossbreeding, crossbred or crossbreeding system is actually a terminal program. OK, I'm going to talk just a minute about rotational crossbreeding. I don't want to spend too much time on that since the, the title of this talk is terminal crossbreeding, but I think it's worthwhile to mention rotational crossbreeding because anytime you have a crossbreeding system where you're you're introducing a different breed into your breeding herd and your females, uh, you have the potential to, of producing some rotational crossbreeding. Rotational crossbreeding is very, very good uh, to introduce new forms of a gene into existing herds or populations. The example I would give there is if you've got some uh, uh, what we used to call British breeds like Angus or Hereford, and you cross those with a Brangus or a Brahmin, you're introducing some genes in that in those offspring that weren't there in the parental uh, females. Uh, and what that can do, for example, uh, in the case of both of those, and particularly Brahmin, you can introduce some, some forms of genes that will make the offspring be a little bit more heat tolerant and a little bit more uh, disease resistant than maybe the, uh, the parental females. In addition, combining two or more breeds can cause one breed's performance for a particular trait to complement the performance of another breed for that trait in the subsequent offspring. And I'll just talk a minute about the, the kind of the classic example of that. The first one of the first forms of crossbreeding we saw in the US was 
uh, back in the late 40s and 50s when people began to cross Angus and Herefords. <clears throat> and if you look at those two breeds, they kind of complement each other. The Angus breed at the time was known more for uh, maternal ability. They tended to be better milkers. Uh, they are also known for their fertility. They tended to be a little bit more fertile, e easier to breed than the Herefords. And they also had a little bit better carcass quality uh, than was typically found in the Hereford breeds at that, in that era. On the other hand, the Hereford breed was uh, a little bit better growing, a little bit faster growing, a little bit larger frame than the Angus breed. So by crossing those two, you produce some, uh, some offspring uh, that I'm sure you probably heard the term black baldies, these black cattle with white faces, that tended to have a little bit better growth than the Angus breed, tended to have a little bit better maternal ability and fertility than the Hereford breed. So it was a very successful cross. And that's just one example of a, 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 of a crossbreeding system uh, that was developed many years ago. When you introduce a third breed into that system, you can introduce some, some additional uh, gene combinations that you don't normally find even in those crossbreds. And by doing that, you can further enhance the performance for specific traits, such as growth, heat tolerance, fertility, and some other things. Okay. Terminal crossbreeding works really well because of these gene interactions. Uh, you take two breeds that have very different alleles for specific genes, and when you when you when you combine those two alleles in the off the, the crossbred offspring, uh, you get a very large phenotypic performance enhancement or hybrid vigor in that first generation of crossbreds. Uh, <clears throat> that hybrid vigor can produce dramatic phenotypic and economic gains in the F1 generation as compared to the average performance of the parents. And I guess an example of that would be coming along in the 70s and early 80s when people began to introduce some of these uh, large continental breeds like Simmental, Charlays, maybe even the limousines and uh, in a few cases, Maine Anjou's, things like that. Into these crossbred Angus Hereford crosses, what they began to find was that those, those second generation crosses really had a lot higher uh, phenotypic production for uh, particularly growth traits and in some type, some type, some types of carcass traits uh, than than were expected when they uh, when they crossed them. Okay, let's talk for a minute about the major advantages of terminal crossbreeding in terms of selecting bulls. Uh, the first one is when you're talking about terminal crossbreeding, where you're not trying to keep any females, uh, a female crossbred calves from that mating, but you're selling all of them to slur to, for slaughter, then you can select bulls with very extreme EPDs for single traits, such as weaning weight or yearling weight. Uh, since all the offspring are gonna be slaughtered, there's no need to consider other traits such as fertility and our maternal traits. In other words, you can pick some bulls that have the, EPDs that are that are right at the top of the breed for growth traits like yearling and weaning weight uh, without causing any subsequent problems with maternal effects or fertility in the next generation because you're not keeping any of those calves for breeding purposes. One caution I would make to you if you're considering uh, selecting bulls for single traits to use in the terminal crossbreeding system is you still have to consider calving ease if you're picking bulls to breed to heifers, even in terminal crossbreeding, because if you don't consider calving ease and high calving ease bulls, you can run into some problems with calving with some of these really extreme bulls, because they will tend to produce large calves. Uh, the second thing is using terminal crossbreeding, you can really emphasize breed differences, and those breed differences can really enhance hybrid vigor in a terminal crossbreeding program. And an example I've got for that is if you take a Brahmin bull or a Brangus bull or something like that, or if you take something like a Charlay or a Limousine, which is a very large breed compared to uh, these, these Hereford Angus British breeds, and you take that, that bull and you breed him to a, to a Hereford Angus cross or some other type of smaller breed cross, then you're gonna get some extreme genetic differences between that sire breed and those, those crossbreed animals and that will lead to a lot of hybrid vigor in the offspring of that breeding and what we call the F2 generation, 
a second generation crossbred. Uh, so that's another another way you can really enhance hybrid vigor is using a bull a, from a breed that's really extremely different from the uh, the breed of the the cows. Okay, <clears throat> keep in mind when you when you're talking about what traits you ought to be considering, keep in mind that the primary focus of a terminal crossbreeding program is usually the performance of the crossbred calves being produced. Uh, you're normally not worried about keeping those calves, particularly the females, uh, for breeding purposes. So if you're going to slaughter all of them, all you're really considering or you're really uh, trying to accomplish here is extreme growth and maybe a few other traits on those crossbred calves so you can take advantage of the economic uh, increase you'll get for their uh, performance. Therefore, selection of bulls for terminal crossbreeding normally should focus on those traits that will enhance the economic value of the calves they produce. And all of you know, uh, some traits have more economic values than others, and you should place more emphasis on those traits, particularly in a terminal crossbreeding uh, program. And for example, as you all know, in the beef industry, we market calves by weight normally. So growth traits typically have more economic value than other traits since cattle are marketed by weight. One advantage of growth traits also in a terminal crossbreeding system is uh, these growth traits have a moderate heritability. And what that means is there are a lot of additive genetic effects for those traits. So if you're selecting bulls that have real highly positive uh, EPDs for growth traits, you'll take advantage of not only those additive genetic effects, but also the, the gene interaction effects in those. Uh, growth traits tend to produce a lot of hybrid vigor and growth traits such as weaning weight, yearling weight, and the residual average daily gain probably should always be considered when selecting bulls in a terminal crossbreeding program. Uh, you can also consider carcass traits. They also have a lot of economic value uh, in a terminal crossbreeding system and selection for those have an adva average advantage that they will not only produce hybrid vigor, but they are also highly heritable. In other words, they have a lot of genetic effects that affect these carcass traits and you can make a lot of genetic improvement through selection in one generation. Uh, however, to take advantage of that, uh, you got to market those cattle so that you can take advantage of those economic improvements in carcass traits. If all you're doing is producing crossbred calves and sell them at weaning, then you're probably not going to get full advantage of those uh, economic improvements in those crossbred calves due to, due to improved carcass traits. If you're, excuse me, backgrounding those, those calves for a while, or if you're marketing them in a way to, a, to an order buyer or to a feedlot buyer or someone, uh, and, and you can show them that you have considered carcass traits and these cattle should have really good carcass characteristics, then uh, you might be able to get a, a, an economic advantage out of the, the buyer for that. Okay, normally in a terminal crossbreeding situation, you don't keep the female offspring from that crossbred generation. So selection of bulls for maternal and our fertility traits really doesn't have a lot of value in a terminal crossbreeding program. You're strictly producing calves to sell or slaughter market in normal circumstances. So what you're really going to take advantage of there are growth traits and carcass traits. Now, I don't have this in a slide, but I want to take just a minute to, to give you an exception to that. There are some cases where if you are producing these F1 female crossbreds and you're marketing those as uh, mama cows, then you take, can take advantage of terminal crossbreeding uh, and you can take advantage of selecting for some other traits other than just growth and carcass traits. The example of that I'll give you is uh, of someone that is maybe maintaining some Brahmin and Hereford cattle and they're crossing them and producing these F1 tiger stripe females. Uh, and then those are marketed or you can keep them yourselves. They're marketing to other producers as a uh, female calf producer, as a, as a mama cow. And then what that person would do is, is take that F1 female, breed her to some other breed of bull 
like a Charlet or a Brangus or something and produce these F2 calves. The advantage of those F1 females in that situation is they tend to these maternal effects and uh, and and uh, fertility effects also seem to respond very well to hybrid vigor. So those F1 females will produce calves that grow a lot faster and and you know market a lot better. Uh, so that's an example of, of an exception to. Uh, to the case of not selecting for maternal or fertility traits in a terminal crossbreeding system. In that case, I would strongly advise someone that is producing F1 females to sell to other commercial producers to use as mama cows. I would strongly encourage you to include maternal and fertility traits in those cattle uh, <clears throat> because they are going to be used as mama cows and you want cattle that not only have good maternal ability uh, to, to, to produce better, faster growing calves, but you also want them to have better uh, than, than average reproductive performance so they'll breed back and you can use them for more than just one year, use them for several years. Now the drawback of doing that is uh, you probably most of the time don't want to keep the F2 females that are a result of those say F1 tiger stripe females because those are going to be half some other breed a quarter Brahmin and a quarter Hereford, and you don't know exactly, it's very unpredictable what kind of maternal and, and, and fertility traits uh, or characteristics that, that those F2s will inherit. So it's probably not a good idea to keep those females. And in that case, what that means is that person that's purchasing those F1s are going to have to keep coming and, and purchasing F1 replacement females. So you basically use those F1s until they'll no longer breed back or don't produce good calves, and then you replace them with the younger. And that's probably the one exception I would I would mention for a terminal crossbreeding program. And you you can call that a terminal program because you're not you're not keeping the offspring of those F1 females for uh, breeding purposes. Uh, once you do that, once you keep those F2 females, then it's no longer terminal crossbreeding. It's rotational crossbreeding. You're starting to rotate another breed in there uh, for those latter generations. OK, the last thing I'll kind of talk about here real quick, finally, is even in a terminal crossbreeding system, I would recommend producers, I would strongly recommend producers never use crossbred bulls to breed your cows regardless of whether those crossbred bulls came from your herd or someone else's. You may have a young bull in your herd that is extremely fast growing. He's got, you know, he's got great confirmation. He's straight on the top line, he's got good feet and legs, and he has, uh, you know, heavy muscle and so forth. The problem is if he's a crossbred, uh, he's probably not going to pass those characteristics on to his offspring in a very predictable manner. When you, when you breed, that crossbred bull, you just really don't know what you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get the genes from his his sire parent or his, his dam parent. Because of random chromosome segregation that occurs in the formation of gametes, you, you can never predict which, which genes a crossbred bull is, will pass on to his offspring. And remember, he passes on a random sample of his genes through his chromosomes, but he doesn't pass on the combination of genes which may have given him superior phenotypic performance. Consequently, his genetic value for any given trait to pass on to his offspring is really completely unpredictable. You're much better off using purebred bulls uh, or at least certified bulls that you can get some EPD information on. OK, how do you determine which breeds to use in a terminal crossbreeding program? OK, I'll give you three little tips that I that I tell producers. First of all, to determine which which bulls to use, use EPDs to select genetically superior bulls for the traits which are going to increase the value of your calves. OK, if you use those EPD values, you're taking advantage of not only their additive genetic effects, but any of those gene combinations they may they may have. As I said earlier in the slide, just picking a bull just because of his breed doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee that you're going to get superior calves from that bull. The second tip I would give you is try to select bulls which will tend to maximize hybrid vigor for economic, economically valuable traits in your calves. 
And those bulls are the bulls. If you remember what I mentioned earlier, those are bulls that are from breeds that are really vastly different from the, uh, the crossbred calves or the crossbred females or the purebred females that you have. When you introduce uh, those Brahmin genes into that Angus Hereford cross, cross or those Brangus genes into uh, uh, some other exotic cross or exotic by British cross like an Angus Hereford cross or I mean a Charlie Hereford cross or something, you're introducing a set of alleles that are really a lot different from those that the animal already has and that will tend to enhance the hybrid vigor. <clears throat> okay, the third thing I will mention is when you're producing crossbred calves, make sure the calves you produce fit the market and, and don't uh, and avoid any price discounts. In other words, make sure the calves that you produce are not going to come out purple with pink stripes or some other odd combination because they, you, you may get severely discounted at the market. They may be really, really good calves with a lot of growth and good carcass traits or whatever, but because of their color, they're going to get discounted. Uh, some examples of that are maybe spotted calves. Uh, spotted calves generally get discounted a little bit. Uh, there was a time uh, several years ago when uh, yellow or, or uh, light brown tan calves got discounted at the market. Uh, the feedlot operators just didn't think those calves performed as well. Uh, so a lot of people that were using Charlays and the brown Simmentals and the uh, uh, crossbreed terminal crossbreeding programs probably got got discounted a little bit. Probably probably discounted enough that it almost offset the advantage they got in hybrid vigor. So try to avoid those combinations. I guess my best advice to you there is is get in touch with someone who's aware of the market someone who's been either buying calves for a feedlot or selling calves to a feedlot, someone who's well aware of what's going on in the market, maybe even your local uh, auction barn uh, operators to tell you kind of what kind of crosses to, to avoid, to avoid those types of price discounts. Okay, that's about all I was gonna talk about in terminal crossbreeding. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you got any. Sorry, I was having problems with my microphone. I do not see any questions right now. Um, again, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat at any time. I'm going to attempt to take the screen, maybe, and share our survey. Um, this will be posted online, um, hopefully within the next few days. And so if you have any questions um, and you're watching either this recording or you've thought of some questions later after you've watched this, you can reach out to me and I'll send those questions to Dr. Hay and get those answered for you. And um, we do have a survey that we ask that you please take just a few minutes to complete. You can do that a couple of different ways. So you can follow the instructions here by viewing the QR code uh, with your camera and clicking on the notification banner and going directly to the survey. I'll also link the survey in our podcast and video descriptions as well. Um, again, Dr. Hay, thank you so much for your time this morning. It looks like you're going to get off easy without any questions today. Um, but again, I'll forward any of those to you if they come in at a later date. Um, if you have any questions regarding our Beef Brunch series, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my contact information is in the video and podcast descriptions. If there's something you'd like to hear um, from any of us in the future, um, any topics that you would like us to present a webinar on, you can also send those my way. We're working on putting together everything for 2022. Um, Dr. Hay, thank you again, and we will see you all next year. Thank you, thank Ashley, you. and you guys have a very happy holidays. You too.